Thank you for visiting Pastor Wyatt TV, the YouTube channel of PastorWyatt.com. I love how Gustavo Delgado is right there with him, watching every move that he makes. And Mage, he looks like he don't have a care in the world. And I don't know, maybe he don't. If I was him, I wouldn't be afraid of anybody either. Cañonero Segundo, Cañonero Segundo, my inspiration. You remember the, the, the interview for you? Cañonero Segundo, the man in uh, 1971. You can tell you, yeah? I talked with, with Gustavo Avila yesterday, today. You want to hang in that area? Please. Okay. trips with pick six king john stetton it's one of the best tools in horse racing for any level of player it's your second set of eyes spotting troubled trips betting angles track trends horses to watch and favorites to fade 10 figs ticket structure and more at Tracking Trips, you're a friend with benefits. Not a member? 
You must hate winning money. Join Tracking Trips now. Visit PastTheWire.com and we'll see you in the winner's circle. Remember, nobody does it better. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Gio Setti with Past The Wire. Back at you to provide a very in-depth analysis uh, for the 2023 Preakness. Uh, thanks for showing up. Thanks for your support over a very lengthy period of time. And by the way, get a pen and paper, something to write with so you could take some notes because um, I'm confident that you'll, you'll take my information as being very informative. All right. But first, listen, as we approach the Preakness, the third Saturday in May, let's recap the first Saturday in May just a bit. Because right now, the, the three-year-old division is basically in shambles. Uh, it's a little disappointing. Um, when you consider, first let's talk about the Derby. All right? I know my backers were with me on Dessalmed. Let me tell you something. The 18-horse race, very deep field as always. Dessalmed ran a very, very brave race. He was boxed in. Uh, for a good portion of the race. Then he was visibly full run, but Kingsbarn, the six, had stopped, got tired and stopped right in front of him. The moment he got away from Kingsbarn and deep stretch, he was full run. Closed for fourth, 27-1. And you know what? Two fills... Probably ran better than anybody that day. Uh, the race was completely tainted. I mean, scratches of the favorite Forte, who was six for seven, two year old champion, uh, practical move, who came into the race on a, 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 a solid win streak, even though I didn't like him, but it was a big scratch. The two Japanese horses that were rented were very impressive visually and on paper. And they never showed up. They, they, they basically never fired. And Tappet Trice. Tappet Trice, for a Colt to be a $1,300,000 uh, yielding purchase, as promising as he looked on paper, no matter what figures you look at, uh, telegraph the, telegraph the uh, buyers, speed form, whatever. He seemed primed to be sitting on a solid, winning type of race. And he never fight. He weighed a lemon. Um, those are the circumstances that show up now and then with the Kentucky Derby. Now, look, I'm not here to take anything away from Mage, right? Uh, when I wrote last week's column on the Kentucky Derby, you know, I didn't side with Mage, but I said some very favorable things about the Colt. You know, son of good magic, uh, nice closing punch, very formidable figures on paper. But you know what? There were just so many other options for that type of horse in the Kentucky Derby, even with the scratches. Uh, but there's no doubt. And like I said, you can't argue with success. I'm not tarnishing his victory. But there's a major asterisk from all the things I just mentioned the three-year-old campaign has been in shambles. All those scratches, uh, Tappet Trice not fi uh, firing, Disarm being blocked around, two fills running a very brave race, but just not having enough in the final uh, 100 yards. Um, so Mage ran the race of his life and, and emerged victorious. But what's sad about it is that for the first time in 54 years, 54 years, we're talking serious stuff here. One horse comes out of the Kentucky Derby into the Preakness, and that's the winner, Mage. So, in a lot of ways, I handicap each race as a brand new race, brand new event. But you know what? There's something about this that the racing gods may take over uh, when you think about the big picture. Mage is going to be favored in the Preakness. And the horse 
even though he did not run as a juvenile, we all know that. It's one of the reasons why I, even though I respected him, I eliminated him from my wagering opportunities or even my top 10 in that field because history is what it is. You're talking about over 130 years of racing history where only one time a horse won the Kentucky Derby after not running as a juvenile, and that was a Triple Crown winner in Justify. And Justify, to me, was a, a much more dynamic cult. So Mage gets into this race basically on his own from the Kentucky Derby, and now it's a field of eight, so seven new shooters, if you will. Um, the seven starters all have their story, but inevitably, Mage is going to be the favorite in a race, uh, over bet, probably rather substantially, um, because of his performance in the Kentucky Derby. I mean, he ran a 105 buyer. Uh, he had a perfect trip. I felt good for Javier Castellano getting his first Derby win. Um, but I'm not feeling it uh, entirely for his chances uh, here in the Preakness. He'll come running at the end. And he's got a, you know, the numbers don't lie. Even if he regressed a bit, he's still right there in the mix. He should be coming hard in the, in the stretch. Remember, it's a, a 16th less, so it's a mile and three sixteenths instead of a mile and a quarter. Uh, it's 100 yards or a football field. Um, he's good, but it kind of bothers me being a racing historian that if Mage wins, now we have the Triple Crown uh, hype. And he just doesn't, to me, a lot of good things about him, but he does. And that's why the three year old division's in shambles. Uh, so he could win. Go over, could win. go over the whole field uh, as I want to. I got my notes to prepare so I don't forget anything. Um, and I think you'll find it very interesting how I break down this field. Okay? So, with that said, let's move on and go over the eight horses entered in this year's uh, Preakness Stakes. Grade one, of course, a million and a half dollars, old hilltop in Pimlico. Um, I think it's very competitive. Field of eight, basically, they're. A, Four genuine contenders, one sort of an outsider, and the other three, in, in, in my opinion, and many opinions of probably across the board handicappers, they really don't belong in a race, but for different reasons, they're in the race. And we're going to go over that. Okay, so number one, National Treasure. Uh, I like to have my notes available so I don't forget any information. Um... Johnny V, who has not won a Preakness yet in his Hall of Fame career. I believe he's 0 for 15 or 0 for 16. Uh, up for Bob Baffett, who's won it plenty of times. He's seeking his eighth Preakness. Eight Preakness. Um, he also has a, a swagger about him because, you know, he hasn't been treated well by thoroughbred racing for a good period of time. He's back in the Triple Crown He'll be in attendance, uh, and he's got a pretty, pretty live horse here. Uh, first things first, definitely one of the contenders in a race, all right? Um, ran three races as a juvenile. Uh, two of them were grade ones. Gets blinkers on. He's got five races to his credit in his career. So many ways he's underperformed, um, but I think he's built for the distance. You know, a half million dollar horse by uh, Quality Road. Working well. I think he's going to demonstrate speed. I'd be very surprised if Johnny V doesn't gun him from the rail. Uh, I think he's got. Better than tactical speed. Uh, I think their plan in this race is break out of the gate, fast and swift, 
seize control of the race and try to go wire to wire. Now, is he good enough to do it? His numbers put him in a mix. Uh, and the fact that he's seasoned with his juvenile races, I wouldn't be surprised if he took that, if he got the lead. Because we're going to get into more, because there's going to be some pace pressure. But if he got the lead successfully, uh, he'll be a threat in a stretch. I particularly like the way he's training, and you have to respect the connections. Is he my top choice? No. But he's going to be a horse that is deserving of respect in this field. Not the strongest prick in this field, but a field that he matches up well to. Uh, and if he runs his best race, and he's certainly training well, he's a win contender. Um, I just think that, I don't know, I'm not entirely convinced he's going to have the lead. That's what he wants. But if he doesn't get it because of the what's outside of him, uh, I think it's going to be tougher for him. So that's their game point. At least that's what I'm thinking. Number two is Chase to Chaos. Now, this is actually pretty chaotic. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention that uh, National Treasure. No, he's already lost to Cave Rock. Another reason why the three-year-old campaign's in shambles because Cave Rock never... Brace now is a three-year-old, and he had a lot of promise as a two-year-old. He lost to Cave Rock, Forte, and Practical Move. Um, and in a San Anita Derby, he lost to Practical Move Skinner, who, who I had highly regarded before he scratched in the Kentucky Derby, and Mandarian Hero, who ran his eyeballs out and uh, just missed. Um... So, oh, anyway, I was starting with Chase the, Ch Chase the Chaos. It's, uh, put a little smile to my face because, <laughs> and all due respect to the connections, uh, you know, and Sheldon Russell getting a, a mount here in the Preakness. Um, winning the El Camino Real Derby on the very dark, synthetic surface over at Golden Gate is basically all he has to offer. <laughs> 50 to 1 in the morning line. To be honest with you, in this field, <laughs> I feel he should be 150, if not 200 to 1. But will he be? No. You know why? Because he's a number in the race. Recreational gamblers like to play long shots. Uh, and, and the only bet I think I would be willing to make, even though it's not available is that this horse is going to run last or next to last. So he's a complete toss, a gelding. Uh, the numbers are just inferior to most in the field. So he hasn't exhibited the ability to run as fast as many of these horses in the race. So I can't use him, and you shouldn't use him too. But for those that like the number two, or they like the, the name, maybe that's the recreational way to go. But I think they're just going to be burning money. You might as well just get a, a $50 bill and light a torch to it or whatever your budget is if you play uh, Chase to Chaos. Uh, listen, I know it's a horse race, but uh, <laughs> extremely unlikely to see that horse even hit the board, let alone winning. It'd be the shocker of all shockers. All right, number three is the Kentucky Derby champ, Mage. Listen, I'm not dissing Mage. The horse looks nice physically. Uh, he won the Kentucky Derby. Uh, he had a perfect trip. And remember, all those contributing factors that I opened this podcast and my analysis with, he was the fortunate one. Sometimes luck is part of the game. He does have a tremendous closing punch. Uh, his figures, as I shared with you, not only are better than anybody in the field based on the Kentucky Derby performance, but even if the horse regressed a bit, you know, say he just doesn't run as well as he did in the Kentucky Derby and a little less distance, he's, it still puts, puts him logically in the mix 
to make a big run in the stretch. But I, I don't know. I, I think the racing gods and the fact that he, for lack of a better term, he ran his eyeballs out in winning the Kentucky Derby. Two weeks later, another son of good magic, uh, didn't run as a, uh, a juvenile, defied the odds in a Kentucky Derby, paid everybody off in terms of uh, mutual price uh, for the people that had him. I'm guessing, logically speaking, they had Mage, not as a single, no way, because if you're a competent handicapper, you couldn't have him as a single because there were better options with the same running style and who were more seasoned. Uh, and of course, you had to take for granted that Tappet Trice wasn't even going to show up in the Kentucky Derby. And he didn't. So many things were aligned between the scratches, who didn't show up, the Japanese runners weigh, uh, weighing an egg, um, you know, disarm being boxed in. And Mage had a wonderful trip. My hat off to uh, Javier Castellano winning his first Kentucky Derby. Um, but I don't know. I see him closing in the Preakness, closing powerfully, but maybe it's going to be a photo. Maybe he's going to be fourth in the photo. Maybe he's going to be fourth, a length and a half off, because it's a little less distance. Um, if he wins, I'll tip my hat again. He could easily beat the field just based on the, the figures alone. And if he wins, there's going to be a lot of hype about the Triple Crown. They're going to sell it with Belmont. I would never consider him in the Belmont Stakes, uh, especially if Tappet Trice comes back. And like I said, I mean no disrespect to Mage. Nice looking Colt. Nice story for the connections of Castellano Winner and and, uh, and and Delgado. Um, but come on, the only horse coming out of the Derby, the horse has had everything go his way. Uh, you know. Horse that beat him on a square twice, Forte scratches, so on, so on, and so on. Uh, he's a contender, can win. Will he win? It's not going to get my money. Will he hit the board? Probably most definitely. Uh, I'm looking towards maybe the triple or the superfecta, not the win or the exact. Let's turn the page to number four, Coffee. With Chris, talking about those recreational gamblers. Everybody named Chris is going to bet coffee with Chris. You know, this colt only cost, two, no, excuse me, horses a gelding. Only cost $2,000. $2,000. 2000 Now running in the Preakness. 12 races to his credit. Most experienced in race. He's the only horse that's won at Old Hilltop at Pimlico. So if you like that angle, he's one over the track, one for one. Uh, Maryland product. The barn I respect is a winning barn, but the figures, buyer speed ratings across the board, and the horse has had many chances to flash brilliance. Nice gelding, uh, pretty good performer. With speed, don't be surprised that this horse is forwardly placed early in the late in the race. Uh, may even have the lead. I think National Treasure is going to try to grab the lead, but this horse is fast enough to get the lead. And if the horse gets the lead, it seems inevitable that the horse is going to tire uh, and be outclassed. So I'm not using coffee with Chris, even though I enjoy coffee, and I know several people named Chris. <laughs> and I know the Christophers or Chris's out there, the recreational players will play a horse, but the way I see it, he gets out, he's forward replaced early, probably good for about six panels, maybe seven eighths of a mile, and then when it really counts, the horse folds. Uh, he beats me, he beats me, he'll not be on my tickets. Number five. Red Route 1. Okay, first things first, it's striking to me, is the horse does have imposing closing ability. The problem is, and this is 
on paper and what I've seen with my eyes in film study. The problem is he's a very slow starter and he closes very late in races. Uh, Asmussen must be respected. Rosario must be respected. So the connections are there. And don't forget that this guy is a son of Gunrunner. Now, many people that follow me, read my columns, they know that I'm a big fan of what all that Gunrunner did and him as a sire. Um, I think he'll be coming. Uh, I think he needs to improve significantly to win and beat this field. Do I think he's talented enough to be considered a contender? Somewhat, but he needs others to fail. And when you need others to fail, you're looking for a more fortuitous outcome rather than being decisive on who you like. Um, I certainly respect, of course, everything I just mentioned. The sire and the pedigree overall. Rosario, who's going to work hard to try to get this horse in position to close powerfully. And Asmussen, who's just about won everything and Got a little unlucky when Disarmed didn't make it into this race. And the way Disarmed, horse I backed tremendously in the Kentucky Derby, was boxed in, full run, and he missed out on winning a Kentucky Derby back-to-back -back years. Uh, and last year, you know, he lost with Epic Center. And Epic Center looked very much the winner at the 16th pole. Um, so I don't think this horse should be eliminated from all your tickets but probably more so late close, somebody else fails. Uh, I see him as a threat to be placed in your deeper triples and your superfectus. Okay? Let's go to number six. Perform. Farragut Lynch. <laughs> up for Shug McGahey. Say that again. Lynch up for Shug, Lynch up for Shug McGahey. And Ashok Begehe, if you remember, 10 years ago to the date almost, he won the Kentucky Derby with Orb, uh, came splashing down the center of the track, closing from near dead last, wins the Kentucky Derby at a price, and then Orb was entered in the um, Preakness. I told myself and hundreds of people that horse would not hit the board at a very low number, which was... I believe it was three to five or four to five that day. And sure enough, he didn't hit the board. Uh, that's a, a race I'll never forget because I was on Oxbow, who went, went wire to wire. And It's My Lucky Day ran second. It was a 300, I believe $340 exacta, which I was on. Uh, wish I had more money back at, the, at that time. But <laughs> um, my point I'm making here is. I like seeing Shug McGee in the race. Tons of respect for him. Great trainer. Horse condition over the years. Um, owners put up 150 Gs. 150,000 as a supplement fee to get this horse in. Now, perform when I studied him on film, he actually has lots of talent. All right? Uh, his last race was quite amazing. <laughs> go and watch it because what he was able to come out of to, to emerge victorious was kind of sick wasn't a graded stakes race um, but you know for a horse to be in that much trouble after a stumble uh, and, and coming out to win also a son of good magic um, hold on a second Yeah, I, listen, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to use this horse on their tickets. Not really a win candidate, but if he has that type of closing punch again, uh, I wouldn't be shocked if he hit your triple or super factor. Uh, like I said, nice story. You got to admire the connections and the ownership putting up 150 Gs just to get him in a race. Uh, you know, it's a large purse, a million five. It should be greater, the Preakness, because of its history. But 
Uh, I don't know. The only guy I could recommend would perform. He's got a puncher's chance. He's not one of the top four contenders, but he's not. I can see him being uh, having some run, aggressive run in a stretch. And I wouldn't be shocked if, if he hit the board. But I like others more, and they're more appealing, and they're coming up right now. So uh, I love the two bottom horses, which we're going to get into. Let's talk about them. number seven, Blazing Sevens. I've been waiting for this horse to run his best race, all right? Son of Good Magic. Good Magic is all over the race. He sired three of these guys. Um, or is it four? Anyway, grandsire of Curlin, you get Chad Brown and Irad Ortiz, as good as connections could possibly be. Um, six races lifetime, four are grade ones, one a grade two in his maiden race. In his maiden, I watched every one of his races several times, and there's some handicappers who probably wouldn't consider some of the things I'm about to say, but you know, you got to look at the progression. Not just the prior numbers, which are important. Uh, Chad Brown, we all know, has done this twice. He skipped the Kentucky Derby to run in the Preakness. He did it with cloud computing and early voting. Now, early voting last year, if you want to go back to my column, you know that I, you know, I was all over early voting last year. Um, and he didn't disappoint. He ran in their perfect race. Didn't do much afterwards, but I knew that Chad had him ready. Now, in my opinion, I believe Chad's got this horse ready to roll. If you look at his timeline and watch all of his races, no exceptions. Maybe somewhat in the blue grass his last race, but the horse has not had a clean trip. He's either in trouble or he's, he's, you know, he's had a bump here or there and went wide, a uh, small field here. I think based on his previous workouts for this race, a minute breezing, a minute and change breezing over at Belmont, uh, I think Ortiz is feeling something because his horse was scratched in the Kentucky Derby. He's a humble rider, but he's an extremely talented rider. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Not only is he going to give it his all, um, but third off a layoff, entered in all those high-quality races uh, as a juvenile at Saratoga, Ran very well, began his career with a blazing performance, uh, and then he just he, he won the Grade One Champagne. Go ahead and watch that race. He beat Verifying that day, who ran in the Kentucky Derby. He was second in the Bluegrass. Um, one would think that his numbers need to improve. You know, rather, I won't say significantly, but a good margin to win. But I feel the talent's always been there. He's he's run with great company. And now he seems to me to be sitting on a, a very favorable, stalking, strong race. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I think you're going to get a nice... Uh, strong run out of Blazing Sevens, who coincidentally is the number seven horse. Major contender on the win end. Um, and actually, I'm going to decide uh, more than likely as him being my top choice. i got to do a couple other things, and I'll tell you why, because we're going to get to the bottom horse, who I like a lot as well. The so number eight is First Mission. Now, this is the son of Street Sense. Fabulous connections. Uh, of course, Brad Cox, Luis Sayas for the Godolphin Barn. Uh, winner, winner, winner. Uh, what I don't like is that this horse did not run as a juvenile. 
But this isn't the Kentucky Derby. So I dug down deep and I looked into his three races that he's had in his career. Lightly, lightly raced. But he didn't win his maiden race. Came back smashing to graduate in his second. Uh, his two-turn races have been great. His last two. And in the Lexington, favorite wins, but, you know, when you watch it, I think he has more after that. Um, I see him as a potential wire-to-wire -wire winner because Luis Sayas is one of the better jockeys running and gunning right out of the gate. Does he need the lead? No. So if National Treasure seizes the lead, of course, Sayas and his intelligence, he's not going to want the horse to get too far away. Coffee with Chris is going to get out. But like I said, at first mission, if those two to the inside of him, for whatever reason, don't break well, National Treasure, Coffee with Chris, then this horse will seize the lead. And if he's on the lead, he's going to be real tough to beat. Uh, I see a tremendous amount of upside with him. I trust Sayaz. I believe he really wants this after laying such an egg in the Kentucky Derby. Uh, tap it trice. Um, horse has done nothing wrong. Lightly raced. And the only box he doesn't check is he didn't run as a juvenile, so he's not seasoned the way I like a horse to be seasoned to win the Preakness. But the whole three-year-old campaign's in shambles. What are you going to do? Throw everything out. In shambles. So if Mage could win the Kentucky Derby, we're only one horse in that spot in 135 years won it. His talent aside, then why can't First Mission win the Preakness? Especially because unless he, his face hits the dirt on the break, I feel it's an inevitable that First Mission around the first turn is first, second, or third at worst. And if he's second or third, he's going to be in fabulous striking position. So, folks, and by the way, working brilliantly at Churchill Downs, I didn't want to leave that out. That's why I have my notes. Uh, write this down. And one thing you got to keep to consider is that first mission, even though he's not as experienced this season as some of the other horses I like, tremendous amount of upside. Now, the three-year-old campaign is in shambles. We have the Preakness, and then, of course, we have the Test of Champions in three weeks at Belmont Park. Uh, I've had my eye on Tappet Trice for the Belmont all year. We're hoping that he's well enough to run in the race. But I don't even know how big that field is going to be. But this horse and Blazing Sevens, or whoever comes out of this race really strong... Not so much to be a threat to Belmont, but later on for the Haskell at Monmouth Park in July and the Travers at Saratoga. So I'm starting to look forwardly with a lot of these Colts because the, the entire division's in shambles. Uh, as a, a, a thoroughbred historian... Even though, like I said, I respect success. Um, but I don't want to see Mage winning. So if you want to interpret that I'm shorting Mage because it bothers me that he won the race because of all those other contributing factors, that's not the case. He ran a big number and Mage is an absolute threat to win this one. But like I said, there's something above the racing gods that may prevent it. And the fact that the horse got less distance and he's, he's facing three other horses who, to, to me, are appearing extremely well-trained and ready for this race. And those three horses are Blazing Sevens, First Mission, and National Treasure. So, with that said, I am going to give you... As I do with all my columns, my precise first to eight order of finish 
Now, mind you, my top two, it's not as decisive as my order is, but I have to put one over the other. So for you exacta players, you may want to consider using both in your exacta uh, with my chop choice taking about 75% of your money. Um, but that's how it shapes out to me. I'm, I'm hoping I covered everything for you. Um, I was going to write a column, but I said, you know, this, this race, I just needed to do a video right here in the SETI podcasting video uh, studio here. Um, so, man, I broke it down and watched a lot of film. Because of the experience and Chad Brown and I Rat Ortiz, Blazing Sevens is my top choice. And you heard everything I had to share about him. My second choice is the eight, first mission. So I'm seven, eight. And like I said, you got to cover eight, seven, because it's not 100% decisive. But I'd be very surprised if the seven and the eight didn't run improved forward type races based on the way they're training. Uh, I'd be really surprised if they did not. Third up. I'm going with National Treasure. Johnny V for Bob Baffett. Now, blink is on, as I said. Keep this in mind. We don't have a crystal ball. But I know Bob Baffett's plan. Johnny V is a Hall of Fame rider. If the horse gets out and establishes a comforting lead, not by five or six, by one and a half to around the first turn. It just makes sense to think that the horse could be a threat as the race progresses. But I don't know if the horse is A, going to have the lead, or is he going to be cooked with coffee with Chris, who I feel the only way that horse could make his presence felt at all in this Preakness is to get out. And the horse has good tactical speed. So, Corfrey Chris could have the lead for about, uh, you know, four eights or half a mile. Um, let's see what happens. But my third choice is National Treasure. He's a possible upsetter in the field based on how he's training. Bob Baffert can't argue with success and Johnny V. So, uh, if you follow me, I'm on 7, 8, and 1. Then, of course, by default, I have to use Mage. Mage is my fourth choice. Make no mistakes. Win candidate. If everything goes right for the horse again, others fail. Others fail to progress. And that horse, even if he regresses a bit, he's still good enough to win. But I just think Mage is going to come and come up short. Uh, to horses that are going to run improved races. He's going to take a step back, a 16th less uh, of a distance. That's a full football field, folks, 100 yards. Um, I'm bothered by, for the first time since 1969, 54 years, if I'm right, a horse comes, only one horse comes out of the Kentucky Derby. Uh, to run in the Preakness. I was bothered when Desson, uh was scratched or his beginning consideration was taken away because uh, I was really ready to to prove to the world that Desson should have been much closer to the win in the Kentucky Derby if it wasn't for Kings Barn stopping in front of him. You could just go check the tape and pause it and watch it. Horse was full of run when he came out of that. Um... So Mage is my fourth choice. Let's go to number five. Uh, now this was five slash six or six, uh, six slash five. And coincidentally, that's their numbers. Number five, Red Route One. And number six, Perform. Uh, these guys, basically, very, both very experienced, as I said. But I trust Rosario and Asmussen a little more. Even though I have a, a, a great love for Shug McGahey. But I'm looking at those two as your possible superfected triple threats at a price. Uh, so they're fifth and sixth. 
And of course, my last two are Coffee with Chris, who should run seventh, tire in a stretch, or beforehand. And then the horse, I said with great uh, love and affection, Chase the Chaos, uh, Sheldon Russell, inferior numbers, gelding. The horse should run last. If he doesn't run last, he'll run next to last. Well, there you have it. Let's hope it's a great Preakness thrilling race. You have my order. I hope you took some notes. I've had the propensity of crushing this race. I've done it several times. I'll be back at you for a column for the Belmont Stakes in three weeks. If you have an opinion, keep it. Please comment uh, or like this video presentation for Pastor Wire. Follow us on Pastor Wire. And I will see you down the stretch again real soon. You guys take it easy. Where's my... Oh, I got to click off. I got this device. with some exciting news. DRF Formulator, the gold standard in past performance information, is now free exclusively on DRF Bets. Join DRF Bets with the promo code WINNING, get a $250 first deposit match bonus, a $10 free bet, and free Formulator already uploaded to your account. Access Formulator's premium features, including sortable trainer stats, race replays, personalized trip notes, and lots more. Free Formulator, exclusively on DRF Bets. Nobody does it better.